We're going to begin a two-part study on one of the most controversial subjects among Christians today, and that is the Sabbath, the Lord's Day. Most professing Christians observe the first day of the week, Sunday, as the Sabbath. Yet the fourth commandment establishes the seventh day of the week, Saturday, as the Sabbath. Sabbath keepers believe we are required by God to keep the seventh day Sabbath as the Lord's day. And they believe worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday is breaking the fourth commandment of God, which is a serious offense and sin before the Lord. There are over 500 professing Christian sects, which include Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah Witnesses, and Mormons that hold the Sabbath law as being the seventh day of the week, which is the required day of the Lord. Sabbath keepers believe the majority of professing Christians grow up with Sunday worship as their custom and tradition, and therefore it has become a mindset, a conformity, that they are very reluctant to alter or change even when presented with the truth of the Sabbath being the seventh day of the week. Sabbath keepers believe the Lord's Sabbath was changed from Saturday to Sunday in the third century by Emperor Constantine, by and through the Catholic Church, to assimilate paganism into Christianity. It is believed that Constantine and the Catholic Church integrated the main medium through which Satan was worshipped in Babylon, which was worship of the sun which pagans did on the first day of the week, hence the term sun day. Now these facts of Constantine and the Catholic Church having implemented blue laws, also known as Sunday laws, are true. Blue laws or Sunday laws were implemented by the Catholic Church in the third century, designed to restrict or ban some or all Sunday activities for religious reasons, particularly to promote the observance of a day of worship being the day of the sun. This itself does give some credence to the Sabbath keeper's claims of Sunday worship being a pagan day of worship. However, we will get more into detail discussing blue laws in part two of this study. Sabbath keepers also believe that most of the modern day churches originated from the Catholic Church, and most churches now ignorantly violate God's Sabbath in exchange of pagan sun worship as the Sabbath. And in doing so, the majority of Christians violate the commandments of God, namely the fourth commandment. Many Sabbath keepers not only believe Sunday worship to be idolatry, but that it is practice instituted by the first beast mentioned in the book of Revelation, who they believe to be the Catholic Church. They believe that all who practice Sunday worship is actually given worship to the first beast, which is the mark of the beast. Again, we will get more into this in part two of this study. Now, everything I just said is but an oversimplification of what most Sabbath keepers believe. So the question is, are Sabbath keepers right? After all, God did command us. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. But the real question is, did Constantine and the Catholic Church actually change the Sabbath? Keep in mind, we're not actually talking about a day, but the Sabbath, which is a Hebrew word, Shabbat, meaning day of rest of the heart. Secondly, does the New Testament establish Sunday as the Lord's day, or is the Sabbath still in effect? Does it make any difference? If so, which day is the Christian Sabbath? We're going to address these questions and claims purely from a biblical perspective. Holy Spirit inspired and led biblical perspective to see truth. So stay with me. Let's proceed. Before we begin to answer the questions regarding the Sabbath, there is something that we must get a firm grasp on. 2 Corinthians 3.6 The letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. In this passage, the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, contrasts the Mosaic Law or Old Testament Law with the New Testament Law or the Gospel, grace. The Mosaic Law, the Old Covenant or Old Dispensation, is referred to as the letter because it tells people what they should and should not do. The letter or the Mosaic Law is a series of writings that regulate moral and civil actions. While the New Testament or New Dispensation is one of spirit speaking to the inner consciousness of man. 
Now we know that Paul is making a comparison between the old and the new dispensations in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 when it is read in context. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Thank you, Kendra. So we see that Paul is clearly making a distinction between the Old Covenant written on stone and the New Covenant that is presented inside of us by the Spirit. Jeremiah 31:33. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And also Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. This is a covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. So we clearly see Paul making the distinction between the old dispensation and the new dispensation. And Paul says that the letter or the old dispensation, the law, killed because no one was able to keep it. It only makes us guilty. Simply put, the Old Testament law or old dispensation reveals all people as lawbreakers. The law kills because the penalty of breaking God's law is eternal death. Even if you sin only once in your whole life, it's the same as breaking all of God's laws. Just as breaking only one link in a chain breaks the whole chain. In contrast, the New Testament or new dispensation brings life, which sets us free from the condemnation of the old law or letter. The whole of the law was fulfilled in the only person who could have fulfilled it, the God-man Jesus Christ, who brought to us a new covenant or new dispensation of God which is superior to the old covenant or old dispensation. Under this new dispensation, we receive the spirit of God inside us and his laws are written on our hearts and minds. So we see in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 8, Paul summarizes the key difference between the old and new dispensations. The first was based on obedience to the written law or the letter. But the second dispensation is based on the blood of Christ and the sealing by the Holy Spirit. The letter only condemns us as sinners, and the sentence is death, and the law made nothing perfect. It only made us no guilt in the penalty of sin. The letter of the law, it tells us in Galatians 3.24, was our schoolmaster, or Greek word pedagogos, which means an overseer authorized to train or bring up a child, so that we would understand that the law as our schoolmaster was for the purpose of bringing mankind to a place of knowing, knowing God's moral and ethical laws and that breaking them brings a penalty of eternal death. Therefore, making man aware of his need for a savior to deliver him from the penalty of eternal death. In contrast, the spirit gives life. Simply put, God provides a rescue from our hopeless situation. God saves us from death and grants us eternal life when we accept his offering of salvation. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Now, Jesus said that spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, the Lord could not have chosen a better representative to share the understanding between letter and spirit than the Apostle Paul, whom himself was a Pharisee, a Hebrew amongst Hebrews, he says, Philippians 3, 5 through 6. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. Note that Paul, a Pharisee, before his encounter with the Lord, 
His zeal for upholding the Mosaic law and traditions was unmatched. To the point he persecuted the Church of Christ, which went against the old covenant traditions and laws. Paul says he believed himself to be righteous based on the law, faultless. And as we are aware, Jesus continuously opposed the Pharisees, Sadducees, Jewish leaders and teachers of the law, who insisted on keeping the letter of the law, but failed to seek out the true spiritual sense or meaning of the Old Testament laws. But instead, they only sought the mere literal observances of rites and ceremonies of religion. There is also another thing that is vitally important for us to understand, and that is the Old Testament was but a typology, a shadow of things to come. It says in Hebrews 8.13, By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. The use of the word new implies that the one which was old is superseded by the one which is new. The point being, the new dispensation would take the place of the old dispensation, and we are no longer to be under the old dispensation as it would vanish away. This does not mean that God's laws given in the old are obsolete and we do not have to follow them, not at all. God's laws are perfect. And Jesus said not one jot or tittle will pass away from the law. So what is meant by Hebrews 8.13 is that the new dispensation brought a new way in which we are to keep the laws of God. And those laws are to be written on our hearts and minds and spirit and not that of mere outward obedience to the letter. Let's see if we can get a better understanding of this by what Jesus expressed in terms of the new dispensation laws. Matthew chapter 5 verses 27 through 28. Jesus starts off by saying, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, in which he was referring to the law, or the letter of the law, saying, Thou shalt not commit adultery. He then goes on to convey the real spiritual concept of that law. I say unto you that if a man lusted in his heart, he has already committed adultery. See, what Jesus does is gives us God's real idea and thought of the seventh commandment which was for man to desire not to violate any covenants, his own or anyone else's. This is the true meaning of the commandment, which goes beyond mere adherence to the letter. Slaves were obedient to the laws of their masters, but does it mean in their hearts they desired to do so or even held the laws to be right? Passing civil rights laws didn't change the hearts of those who still held prejudice and discriminated against people because of the color of their skin, yet they were those who still obeyed the civil right laws. Outward obedience does not change the heart. It merely brings an awareness of the law, but does not convert one's purpose of will in their heart to keep the law. I hope you got that. Through obeying the letter, many think in themselves, I haven't slept with anyone's spouse or someone's spouse, I haven't slept with anyone else. Therefore, I have not committed adultery. That's how letter keepers want to define the law. However, God's idea and thought of adultery speaks to the motive and intent of the heart. So Jesus says, if you lust within your heart, you have committed adultery. Why? Because it is from the heart that proceeds adulteries and other things. It is not the physical act that condemns us, but our will and desire to do so. So we see the real concept of the seventh commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, is not in the technical letter, but the desire to violate a covenant yours or someone else's, which in fact actually begins with violating the 10th commandment. You shall not covet thy neighbor's wife or husband. So let's explain it this way. Jesus is saying, King David, when you were up on the rooftop coveting Bathsheba, you allowed in your heart to violate the 10th commandment, which then led you to violate the 7th commandment, committing the act of adultery, which resulted in you violating the 3rd commandment, Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. As a representative of God, you cause people to speak falsely against God. But before that, when you allowed covetousness in your heart, you placed your lust above your God, which violated the first commandment, have no other gods before me. And because you did, you violated the ninth commandment, bearing false witness against thy neighbor, when you tried to deceive the people about getting another man's wife pregnant. All of these violations began with your violating the 10th commandment, which ultimately led to your violating the 6th commandment, thou shalt not commit murder, 
which you did to cover up what you had done. Now there it is, the spirit of the law, right there, versus the letter of the law. Had David simply followed in his heart to love thy neighbor as yourself, he would have forsaken coveting thy neighbor's wife. And what is coveting but lusting or desiring in your heart someone or something that does not belong to you? Is coveting a physical act? No. But it is the spark that triggers the action. And had David not coveted in his heart, the rest of the events would not have occurred. This is the concept or spirit of the law Jesus teaches, which is more than the mere adherence to the letter of the law. This is a new dispensation of the laws that have been written on our hearts and minds. Now, armed with this understanding, let us address the questions. Is worshiping on Sunday the first day of the week instead of Saturday, the seventh day of the week, breaking God's law of the Sabbath? Secondly, does the New Testament establish Sunday as the Lord's day, or is the Sabbath still in effect? Does it make a difference? If so, which day is the Christian Sabbath? Matthew chapter 12 verses 1 through 14. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. He answered, Haven't you read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple was here. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, would you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out, and it was completely restored just as sound as the other. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Now we don't need to get all theological about this passage. We only need to apply common sense. Matthew 12, 1 through 14, as well as Mark chapter 2, 23 through chapter 3, 1 through 5, and Luke chapter 1, 1 through 10, clearly shows us the Sabbath keeper's assertion of outward observance of keeping the Sabbath is not only misguided, it's also unfounded. But that is not to say they are wrong. However, their belief that Sunday observance under the new dispensation as being a serious offense and sin against God is also misguided and unfounded. But more importantly, their belief in the strict adherence to the seventh day Sabbath places both the scriptures and our Lord Jesus Christ in a very serious compromising position. Let's analyze the case. On a certain Sabbath day, Christ and his disciples were passing through a grain field. The disciples, being hungry, began to pluck ears of grain and to husk them with their hands. The Pharisees saw the Lord's men and began to question Jesus as to why his disciples did that which was unlawful to do on the Sabbath. These are the basic facts of this episode. Now, based on these facts, this would mean that not only did Jesus violate the Sabbath, but he encouraged his disciples to do so as well. And according to the letter of the law, the Pharisees and the Sabbath keepers have to believe that Jesus himself transgressed the law of the Sabbath, violating the law of God, which would mean Jesus committed sin. That would then make the biblical affirmation regarding Christ's perfection false and the sacred Holy Scripture's integrity placed in question. More importantly, if Jesus broke the law of God, he would have been unable to function as the spotless sacrifice for our sins or operate as our high priest. Consequently, we would remain unredeemed. So if you strictly believe that we must follow the seventh day Sabbath law of God and any deviation of that is a serious violation, sin and idolatry, then why do you believe in Christ as the Messiah, the Redeemer? since he himself not only violated the Sabbath, but encouraged others to violate it as well. 
Shouldn't those who believe in the strictness of the seventh day observance of the Sabbath law stand in the shoes of the Pharisees, who because of their strict adherence to the letter of the law, perceived Jesus and his disciples violated the law of the Sabbath, which made them seek even the more how they might kill Jesus? Now, does this mean that believing in keeping the seventh day Sabbath is wrong? Absolutely not. Actually, it's commendable and admirable to want to keep the seventh day Sabbath. However, in holding to the mere letter of the old dispensation law of the Sabbath as Saturday only, while under the new dispensation is not only a misunderstanding of the spirit of the law, you yourself become a violator of the law by accusing the guiltless, condemning them. What do I mean by this? Well, Jesus plainly said to the Pharisees regarding their condemning his disciples for violating the seventh day Sabbath in Matthew 12, 7, if you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent or guiltless, which is the Greek word anitios, which is a term that describes one who is not liable or to blame in the matter of a crime. Basically, Jesus said the disciples broke no law. Yet because the Pharisees did not understand the true idea and concept of the fourth commandment, they passed judgment, condemning the innocent. Jesus next went on to say, for the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now let's go back to verse six, where Jesus said one greater than the temple is here. The expression greater than the temple is a clear affirmation of Christ's authority as deity. And if the priests implementing Jehovah's business could work on the Sabbath, surely the disciples operating on behalf of God the Son were equally blameless in their conduct of working on the Sabbath. The priests served, worked on that holy day without any guilt whatsoever. What the priests did was authorized by God. I hope you didn't miss that. Because the Bible tells us that we all who have been called of the Lord have our own holy priesthood before him. Jesus then cites the case where David unlawfully ate the tabernacle showbread. And since the Pharisees did not condemn David, who actually did what was not lawful, why are they now irrationally now condemning Jesus' disciples, who had only breached their uninspired traditions? Jesus clearly demonstrated that not all labor on the Sabbath was condemned, unrighteous, or in violation of God's Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He's the one who actually has the authority to determine how the Sabbath would be used. The last point is this. Jesus tells us the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. What does Jesus mean? What Jesus means is that the Sabbath was designed for the benefit of man. It was an act of mercy from God to grant the Hebrews a respite one day a week to rest the body and refresh the soul with religious exercise. In contrast to the grueling daily work as slaves in Egypt, the Israelites were commanded to take a full day of rest each week under the Mosaic law. Instead, the Pharisaical law had morphed the Sabbath into a burden, adding restrictions beyond what God's law said. The Sabbath law was never intended to be a slavish regulation that functioned as an end within itself. Jesus reminded the Pharisees of the original intent of the Sabbath was rest. Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill, but they remained silent. The Sabbath was not intended to burden people, but to ease their burdens. For someone to forbid acts of mercy and goodness on God's day of rest is contrary to all that is right. Jesus, being Lord of the Sabbath, pointed to the rest he provides. Jesus became our rest when he did all the work necessary for our salvation. He fulfilled the law of the prophets. Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. We rest spiritually in him. As believers, we are set free in Christ. We are not judged by whether or not we keep the seventh day or the first day as observation in worship of God. Instead, we follow the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ. We find our rest in him, and seven days a week are filled with worship of him. Now we're going to end part one of this study with Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 23. Except the one 
whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Now, there is no getting around this passage. The actual controversy is that which is promoted by the devil is the contention between Christians over the day of worship, not the day, but the dispute over the day. Are Sabbath keepers right of the original Sabbath being the seventh day of the week? Yes, but does it promote them any more unto God? No. Is Christians who worship on the first day of the week violating God's commandment? Absolutely not. It is faith, and if you do not get that, then you don't get it. Faith is what promotes us unto God. The controversy and dissension lies with the devil, not the Sabbath. Constantine and the Catholic Church may have implemented blue laws or Sunday laws, but they could not, cannot change the actual Sabbath, Shabbat, which is the day of rest of the heart, because that's a matter of faith. Verse 22, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. Secondly, does the New Testament establish Sunday as the Lord's day or is the Sabbath still in effect? Does it make any difference? The answer to these questions again is based upon one's faith committed unto God. It is the matter of the Sabbath or Shabbat, not the day. Verse 10, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we all stand before God's judgment seat. As it is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will acknowledge God. Verse 14, I am convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean to them, then for that person it is unclean. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God. Verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. And what Paul is speaking about also encompasses the day of worship, the actual true meaning given by faith in oneself of Shabbat. Now we're going to stop right here. In part two of this study, we're going to address what is currently going on today about the enforcement of blue laws, Sunday worship, paganism, and the mark of the beast. So may God bless and keep you, my brothers and sisters, in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Fellowship in the Word. If you've been blessed by this video, please click the subscribe button and the bell to receive notification of when we upload new videos. Thank you and God bless you.